Right. Setting up a character in Foundry is fairly straightforward and consists mostly of dragging and dropping things onto your character sheet. To start off with, get a character sheet by heading over to the Actors tab in the top right and open up Blank Sheets. From here, take any of the blank character sheets and as the very first thing, rename them. If you don't have a name in mind for the character, use your Discord name. Just anything where you'll be able to find them again later. Uh, from here, you'll then find that it's renamed, and I would also recommend in the very bottom left, right-clicking the player you're logged in as, going to user configuration, releasing whatever character it might have, and then finding your character. It sh should be in alphabetical order. That way now, using the C key, you can open up the character sheet, or by just right-clicking this tab, instead of having to go there and open up the right sheet. The very first step, um, I would actually recommend setting an image, or at the very least, I'll show it off so that you know how to do it for later. You click the uh, face at the top left there, and this will open up two things, one for the avatar, one for the token. Over here at Add Layer, the third button is for Upload from your computer. Click that, select an image, and click Open. That'll take a minute or a moment or two to upload, and then you have something. Um, you probably want to delete the previous layer, and on the other layer, delete these two, add layer, move them below, and then as this is unlocked, you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and zoom out, and the clicking and dragging the left mouse button to pan and move it around. Once you're done, then just click OK. If you want a different frame, then go over to Add Frame, It'll take a moment and then just choose one of these. There is a bunch of them. In this case, I'll take an aqua one. This can take a moment to load and then delete the old frame. And there we go. That's it. The main or the first three choice, uh, four choices rather, are your ancestry, the heritage, which is kind of like a subclass with the ancestry, your class, and your background. Not necessarily in this order. I'll start with ancestry and I've chosen to make this person a halfling. So you just take this, drag it in, done. Heritage gets a little bit more annoying. Uh, most of them are fairly easy to do. If you just put in your uh, ancestry, you'll be able to find the subgroups for that. There are, however, also versatile heritages, things like ASMR and Tiefling, which you can apply to almost any ancestry. For those, you might, might want to take a look on the Archives of Nephthys or on Pathbuilder. In this case, I'm going to go with a Twilight Halfling, because I feel like it. For a class, I'm going to make this one a Bard. Um, the classes I do not recommend for first-time players are the Alchemist, the Oracle, and the Summoner, in particular. Uh, a couple of others, like the, the Witch, the Wizard, the Thaumaturge, they're more complex as well, but they're not quite as bad as those three in particular. If you want to go for a spellcaster, the bard and the sorcerer are definitely the easiest and quite powerful. Um, for martial classes, barbarian, champion, uh, fighter, gunslinger, monk, ranger, rogue, uh, they're all pretty straightforward and all quite good. In this case, though, as said, I'm going to take a bard, at which point it's going to ask me for the muse, which is the subclass for the bard in question. This one, I'm making an enigma. So just set that. You can always change it around by just dragging it in again and choosing a different one. So if I want to be a polymath instead, there we go. I'll change it back to Enigma. Close that, find a background, and yeah, here's the whole here there's a whole bunch. Um no, whatever, I'll go gambler. Right. And that's about a third of the character creation done. Uh, the next big step is your ability scores. Open that with edit, and you'll find one thing particular here, which is the third row here is your class ability boost. That ability you want to have as a plus four or an 18. Um, you can get away with a 16, though I don't necessarily recommend it, and especially if you want to go lower than that, you really need to know what you're doing most of the time. Um, in this case, the halfling has a flaw in strength. If I want to go with a fighter or a monk based heavily on strength, then there is one way to get around that, which is 
Actually, there's two ways. The first one is with voluntary flaws, where you put flaws into two abilities. Oh, wait, no. You click legacy flaws, you put flaws into two abilities, and then you get one boost out of that. The other one, the more new one, is the alternate boosts, where you lose the flaw, and instead of getting three boosts, where as the halfling it's set to dexterity, wisdom, and one of your choice, you just get two boosts instead. The uh, number in the circle here is the amount of boosts. I'll actually go with this because dexterity, wisdom, and charisma are all fine, and having a flaw in strength is not all too bad in this case. Um, on the second line with the gambler, backgrounds have, um, get you, uh, give you two ability boosts, but one of them must be in one of two skills. In this case, dexterity, charisma. That's fine by me. I'm going to go charisma. I feel like intelligence. And last, you have a set of four ability boosts. You get to choose four different abilities and boost them all. I'll go Charisma, Dexterity, Constitution, and drop another into Intelligence. And with that, I'm done. That then leaves me with a plus four in Charisma, and some Dexterity for AC, Intelligence for more skills, Constitution for a couple of hit points. Well, one at first level, but still. We're done with this tab, but there are several others which are these circles on the horizontal blue bar. Most of these you don't need, or at least half of them you don't need. If you go to the circles at the very far right of that, you can remove some of them. I would recommend removing the Pathfinder Society, effects, crafting, unless you have an alchemist or an inventor, uh, spellcasting, unless you have spells, of course, and biography, if you want it or not. This leaves this a whole lot more usable. The next step before we move on to the other tabs actually is to figure out how many skills we should have. First open up the description of the bard by clicking on the edit there. And here it just has everything for the bard. Uh, what you get at each level, how their composition spells work, their initial proficiencies, the subclasses, everything. Um, you can also get these in the list of classes, if you just click them rather than drag them over, that will also open up this window so you can see what that class gets. In this case, what we care about, most of this has already been set, but one of them is not. This tells us that the bard is trained in occultism, performance, and then has skills of your choice equal to 4 plus int, which in this case, 4 plus 2 would be 6 skills that we get to choose. The background also gives you some skills. In particular, it makes you trained in deception and gives you a lore skill. Let's go over to the skills, which are the tab called Proficiencies. The first thing we'll note is some of these are already set as trained. Uh, performance and occultism from the bard, deception from being the gambler. We do have to add in the lore skill by hand though, which we do by clicking add here, renaming it to whatever it is, and setting it to be trained. Uh, we get another four plus intelligence skills now, which we can choose from any of these that are not yet already trained. You cannot go from trained to expert with these, just untrained to trained. Or you can add in more lore skills. So if I wanted another lore for, um, say, prophecies, I could do that. Become trained in that. So that's another five to choose. Acrobatics is never a bad one. Stealth is never a bad one. Intimidation is handy. Diplomacy, that's one, two, three, four. Uh, society is not bad. That's five of them. And, well, with prophecies, six. And that's the skills done. Next up is feats. If we go over to that tab, we'll find there's an empty slot here. Martial classes also get an empty slot at class feats. So if we open up, for example, Cosmor here, we will find he has chosen the class feat, Ranged Reprisal. You also get a skill feat set by your background. The class features are all the various things of your class. So if you click that, we'll see Muses. These are the subclasses. If we click Enigma, it'll tell, we, it'll tell us what we get from that. And it says you gain the Bardic Lore feat, which is set in here. Uh, which actually it says you are trained in Bardic Lore. Let's go set that to Add. There we go. Uh, the rogue, I believe, if I can find them. No, oh, that is this one. Um, 
In addition, also has a skill feat um, that they get to choose at first level, which I did not ever set for this guy, it looks like. Whoops, I'll do that later. Um, the way you set them is you go to the magnifying glass on the far right, click that, and it'll open up the list of all of the options. Not all of these are necessarily actually options for you. If you click, for example, Watchful Halfling, well, okay, not that one. Um, surely one of these should have prerequisites. Hmm. Well, apparently none of these have prerequisites. Sometimes they have prerequisites that say uh, have a heritage, specific subclass, etc. You can only, of course, pick those if you actually have that subclass, heritage, etc. Um, as these do not have any prerequisites, we can take them. In this case, I'm going to go for... Well, halfling luck is always pretty damn good. Just drag that in, and that's set. That leaves us with the bard with just two more things. For a martial character, this would be just one. I'll go over the inventory first, because that's what the martial characters have. Click the plus here to add the 15 gold pieces you start with at first level. And then I recommend dragging your character onto the map. You select them, you, uh, you can deselect by clicking or dragging outside. But with them selected, you'll find they have this orange border. This makes buying things a little bit easier. We click the magnifying glass for any of these. Um, well, having a dagger at hand is never bad, so we find a dagger. To the far right are these coins. If we click this while having the token selected on the map, then that will subtract the appropriate amount of gold and add the dagger to the inventory. So I'll remove dagger again, uncheck weapon. Here we find there's a whole lot of items. So what I recommend at this point is to open levels and select things of level 0 and 1, that actually still leaves us with a lot. So let's change this from 200,000 gold pieces to 15. And that looks a whole lot better now. Uh, you will find there are also class kits for the ver or for at least most of the various classes. These have a whole bunch of stuff already inside, so if we look at the class kit for the bard, it has studded leather armor, a dagger, ra uh, dagger rapier, sling with 20 bullets, Adventures pack and a handheld instrument. In this case, I'm going to forgo this, but the Adventures pack does look like it's a pretty good choice because it has um, a whole bunch of just standard things a backpack, rope, etc. So, I'm gonna buy me one of those. Uh, armor is not a bad option. If we look under proficiencies, we'll find also that under weapon and armor proficiencies, we are trained with light armor. So if we select Armor, open Armor Filters, Light Armor, we can take any of these. Well, maybe not the Reinforced Chassis, uh, but of the others. We will find we have a Dexterity Modifier of plus two. Various armors have different stats. So if we open up the Leather Armor and the Studded Leather Armor to compare, and head over to Details, we'll find that Leather Armor gives an AC bonus of one, while Studded Leather Armor gives an AC bonus of two. However, they've, leather has a dex mod, modifier cap of 4, while leather has 3. If our character had a dexterity modifier of 4, or higher, then leather armor would only apply 4 of those, and studded leather armor would only apply 3. So for a character with 4 dexterity, or a plus 4 dexterity modifier rather, both of these would result in the same AC. As we have less than that, however, the studded leather armor will give us more AC. We'll also find they have a strength threshold. If you meet or exceed that uh, um, that strength, got him, uh, that strength threshold in um, as your score, then you do not get the penalties. If you are under that, you do. In this case, leather, uh, light armor does not have any speed penalty and just applies a minus one to acrobatics, athletics, stealth, and thievery. Those are kind of handy skills, but in this case, having the higher AC is worth it to us, and we take the penalty either way. So we're going to choose studded leather armor for this character. We then also have to equip it, but that'll raise our AC from 15 to 17, which we can now see here. 15 is kind of low, but if you're not on the front line, you can survive with it. 
17 is a lot better. You still don't necessarily want to be on the front line, but uh, you're going to be hit, and especially critically hit, a lot less. There's 10 gold pieces left at this point, though. Uh, I will actually use those to buy stuff later, because you can buy various consumables, such as spell scrolls. But I said, I'll get to those later. For the moment, let's over to head over to spellcasting and spells. Unfortunately here, we do have to set everything up. So if we go over here again and open up the bard, we will find that they have composition spells, which are a type of focus spell, as it says here. So we add spellcasting entry, spellcasting type of focus, um, and then we'll also find that uh, the bard has a cult, to, uh, a cult spell casting. So we'll go magic tradition, occult. Not that it matters too much for the focus spells, really. Proficiency magic tradition spell ability is charisma for the bard as the key ability, which should also be listed here somewhere. Yes, key ability, charisma in capital letters. Create. Let's fill in that focus point and head over to over here. Um, we will find that the Enigma does not give any focus spells, but we do find under composition spells, if we click this again, it'll make its own window. It gives us counter performance, which we can drag in here, and inspire courage, which we can also drag in here. Focus spells cost one focus point to use. Uh, you can use focus points similarly to how a spontaneous spellcaster uses spell slots. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, but focus cantrips, you can cast just like cantrips. They do not use any focus points. You can cast them as often you like. There is the further limitation with composition spells that you can only cast one per turn. Not that this matters because Inspire Courage doesn't stack with itself. So close that again and scroll back down and we'll find occult spellcasting. So add spellcasting entry, uh, spontaneous, as we will find that, um, is it here somewhere? Actually, I'm not finding it. Uh, if, you have, if your class has a spell repertoire, it is spellcasting. If it has a spell book or so, something similar to the sort, it is prepared casting. Well, let's go with that. Create. Um, the bard has, at first level, two first level spell slots, so put in a two, that is the wrong button. Uh, put in a two here, and restore those slots. And we find then also that they know five cantrips, and through reading the various things here, we'll find that, yes, each day you can cast up to first, two, level, uh, two first level spells, and under spell repertoire, at first level, you learn two first level occult spells of your choice and five occult cantrips. Um, in addition to these, we also get one more from the muse. You add a true strike to your spell repertoire. That is in addition to the others. So again, open up the spell browser, which I have minimized up here, which you can do by double clicking the things. And we'll find a whole lot of spells. This is a bunch of first level spells. If you are a bit overwhelmed, I can recommend going to source and limiting it to the core rulebook. In addition, you don't get any uncommon spells either, so if we close this, open up rarities and select common, that will filter out the uncommon and rare options. This is still a bunch, but it's not as bad. At first level, uh, Magic Weapon is just a very potent buff, so I'm going to dump that in. Um, not to this character in particular, but to their martial allies. And um, Mage Armor is kind of useless, as they already have nor uh, normal armor, but... Um, Soothe is a quite good healing spell, but I'm actually going to pass on it, and I'm not seeing it here, I'm, because this is Tradition's Arcane. It should be a cult. This is correct. Uh, thankfully, Magic Weapon is also on this list. I could choose Soothe, but I'm actually going to go with Fear as a fairly good debuffing spell. In addition to these, True Strike, which will probably not be used because this character is not going to be making attacks. We can then uncheck spells, check cantrips, and here we go. I recommend a attack option such as Telekinetic Projectile, 
and then whatever else you think might be useful or fitting. Uh, guidance is not very useful to a bard, unfortunately, so I'm going to skip that one and um, go with Sigil. There. That would be this character almost completely set up. I'm going to go to Inventory and now add a couple of scrolls. I mentioned before that I, was, uh, that I chose not to choose Soothe. I can add it as a spell scroll. If I drag the spell onto the inventory, it'll give me the option of adding it as a scroll, which create item. We will see by editing this that it is, has a price of four gold pieces, so reduce this by four, and for the hell of it, I'm going to also add a scroll of color spray. Subtract this by another four. That's the character done.